Okay, <clears throat> this is about my second LP. My first uh, long playing album was uh, Holiday in Hollywood. It came out on uh, long playing record, I forgot to mention, uh, cassette and eight track, which I have copies of every one of them stored away. My second album was self-titled called Richard Step. It came out on Vera Cruz label out of uh, Edmonton. Uh, I was recorded at Sundown Studios in Edmonton and Smooth Rock Studios in Calgary. Uh, it, it has the title as producer as West Dacus. West Dacus owned uh, Sundown Studios in Edmonton. He was famous for... Uh, he had a band many years ago called West Dacus and the Rebels. They were one of the early bands in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and on keyboard in the studio, we hired this band, uh, some of the people from this band called One Horse Blue, which released, I don't know, they probably had two or three or four albums out themselves, on, uh, on all on the Vera Cruz label. And they were all recorded at sundown. They were sort of like the house musicians, but nowhere near what they had in Hollywood. As I said, this going to Edmonton was my biggest, biggest, biggest mistake ever. Uh, getting involved with the McKinnons in Calgary pretty well ruined my marriage and ruined everything else. I should have went to uh, Nashville when, when Andy offered me. I kicked myself every day for that. Anyway... Quit whining, Richard. Uh, uh, so anyway, what we had is on the keyboards and piano was Mavis McCauley, who was a really good vocalist and an artist in her own right. She had an album or two out herself. She was in a band called uh, Foster Child out of Edmonton, which uh, I think Peter Sweetser that later on played uh, keyboards with me sometimes uh, in my in the Richard Step band. He... Uh, he was so good, that guy. He could just jump in anywhere and you know, didn't have to tell him the key or anything. Uh, Peter Sweets are still playing, and he is fantastic. But anyway, Mavis McCauley played on my album, and she also did some of the background vocals, and I also played the piano on the album. Uh, I only started playing on my own albums and re recordings, uh, except for the Northwest Company, of course, where I played drums. I played guitar a little bit on... Uh, uh, on my second album, I don't know which songs for sure, and I played the piano on uh, Too Hot to Handle. That was the first time anybody ever heard my boogie-woogie piano. And on sax on that Too Hot to Handle, we had a guy named P.J. Perry, who was very famous in Canada. He's won Juno Awards and all kinds of jazz awards, and he's had many, many bands and all jazz bands, but th th he's still playing too. He's fantastic, that guy. And then we had uh, Barry Allen uh, worked on the album. He's a famous guy, too, out of Edmonton. He actually uh, was in a, an original band called the Paint, uh, Painter Band. They were called Painter. Uh, and he, he helped produce and mix. And he, uh, he was an award winner. He put out four or five albums himself. Um, he was... Uh, sort of like a star around Edmonton because uh, Marsha, my wife's uh, brother, John, that lives up there, phoned me up one day and said, oh, Barry Allen's coming to town to do a show. So I guess he was kind of big up there. And then another guy that worked on the album, he was engineering and producing too, was Jerry Dare. Um, he was in a band called China White. He was a guitarist around Edmonton. Um, I suppose he played some of the guitar on the thing uh, on the album and um, and then we had a guy named Rocco he, uh, he, he I forget his real name he played the uh, he, he he played the drums on the cuts and he was in a band called One Horse Blue also and uh, another guy was Gay Delorme who is a really famous uh, guitarist around actually in the world he wrote the rodeo song well, it's 40 below, and I don't give a fuck. Got a heater in my truck, and I'm off to the rodeo. Alleman left, Alleman right. Get off the stage. You know, get your right foot right. Get off the stage, you goddamn goof. You know, you piss me off, you fucking jerk. Get on my nerves. Well, here comes Johnny with his 
pecker in his hand. He's a one-ball man, and he's off to the rodeo. Anyway, he wrote that song. And he used to sing uh, Asshole from El Paso. <laughs> but Jim, uh, Gator Lorem, he did an album with the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. He, he was a fantastic guitarist. Um, he could play like flamenco guitar um, and uh, electric guitar. He, he was sort of like from the Chet Atkins style. And uh, I can't say enough good things about Gay. His sense of humor was great. And he was so funny in the studio. Uh, him and Howard Steele were doing a lot of cocaine when we were recording. Down, we went, we went into the uh, studio in Edmonton and cut a whole bunch of tracks. Now, up there... We had Jim Gaines. He was the first guy they hired us to produce the album. And Jim Gaines come up and stayed in a hotel there, and uh, Derek McKinnon hired him to come up. I don't know how much he paid him, quite a bit. Uh, maybe, I don't know how much he paid him, 10000 bucks up front. I know that for sure, all expenses. Uh, anyway, Jim Gaines come up. Uh, he was a really nice guy, sort of like a, I don't know, he reminded me of a guy from Louisiana or somebody. At the time, he was actually from California. He lived in Grants Pass. And uh, he worked with Santana. He did all, he engineered all the Santana stuff in the early days. And he also did that big famous album that came out uh, in around 2000 something with the, like a rebirth of, of Carlos Santana. That was a Grammy Award, award uh, winning album. And Jim Gaines has won all kinds of Grammys. He also produced Stevie Ray Vaughan, the album that um, The House is Rockin'. That album he produced, and he also produced uh, a lot of Steve Miller stuff. He's mostly an engineer rather than a producer. Andy was a producer, Andy DiMartino. Andy had a little bit more sense on what was hit records, and Jim Gaines was like a master of the board and, you know... Uh, he he worked with Huey Lewis and the News, the Doobie Brothers, John Lee Hooker, George Thorogood. So Jim Gaines was sort of in the blues field. So when my album was finished, it was sort of a bare bones album, and it uh, you know it was sort of produced more like Jim Gaines would do stuff. Um, too bad I just didn't stick to blues stuff on that because he would have been the perfect guy. But anyway, when it all was over and done. Derek and the the people that were involved back in the album listened to it and they weren't happy with it because compared to Holiday in Hollywood, it was just like, you know, there was no comparison. And I remember when I, well, I'll tell this later, when, when Bill Crompton heard that album, actually when the whole album was finished and came out, he said, that's not as good as your first album, Richard. And I got pissed off at him. I was playing at a gig and walked away from didn't talk to him for a few years, but he was right anyway. I couldn't take it, you know. And so uh, the next guy we got after Jim Gaines, uh, we went down to Smooth Rock Studios in Calgary and started to redo it again. So we flew up this guy named Howard Steele from L.A. also. He was a very famous producer, and he, uh, he'd produced songs by the Pointer Sisters, he did California Dreamin' with the Mamas and Papas, Dusty Springfield, he worked with Carl Perkins, Frank Sinatra, Etta James, Lionel Richie. So he was really up there too. Um, and he, he was a nice guy too. He was doing coke at the time, so a lot of people were in those days. And uh, when we were at Smooth Rock, him and Gay were going in the back room all the time snorting up working on my record, and I also had, uh, I had um, um, Gary Peterson from the Guess Who. They they got him in to play the drums on, uh, I think it was, uh, might have been too hot to handle. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I think, I think he played drums on that song, Too Hot to Handle. I'm, I'll look at the credits and and get back to you about that. But he played on my album too, the guy from the Guess Who. He's a great drummer. And while I was out in Calgary, I did... Uh... Anyway, <clears throat> what happened is the album got finally finished and we shopped it around to different record companies, but nobody bid on it. You know, it's 
A lot of people like that second album now, but it's it just doesn't have the the magic the first one has. So anyway, and I could have, I should have had somebody, you know, steering my career then, like Andy DiMartino could have done because he knew what songs to pick and everything. I had too much say in this thing, you know, and I thought I, by that time, I thought I was on top of the world about everything. So, you know, I made some bad decisions there, real bad. Anyway, I did some, while I was out there, the uh, McKinnons, I would stay at their house. Uh, Lynn McKinnon, Derek's wife, sort of took over my management. And then uh, uh, she lined me up TV shows. I did radio interviews in Calgary, Edmonton. Um, I did ones for Vernon, uh, Kelowna. I did some in Vancouver. Vancouver never accepted me as a star like uh, they did out in Calgary. And Actually, I'm bigger in, in the States. My record was... People know me all over the world, all over Europe and Japan and, and Korea more than they do in Vancouver. My friend West used to call me the most unfamous, famous guy in, in the music business. Um, anyway, I, I played around in Calgary a lot and uh, the album finally came out and um, it came out on Veracruz but you know they were such a small company they didn't know how to promote I, you know I can, when I think back of it it really makes me sad that it never got the promotion and you know the, my first album got big promotion front of Billboard magazine you know Record World all these things and and they made deals all over the world. I even have a 45 from France that came out, you know, and who knows where else, uh, you know, it came out in Sweden. I don't have any of the records that came out there, but, you know, there was, the second album just was such a rinky-dink production. And I think Derek spent about 80,000 bucks to record it. And I know they, they never, uh, or maybe a hundred, they never re spent anywhere near that on my first album. But anyway... I did, uh, while I was out in Calgary, I I used to go out there for weeks and record. And, you know, it made me get, it, it sort of broke me up with my family because I'm staying at this place, these McKinnon's house all the time. And they're uh, whining and dining me and, you know, I'm smoking cigarettes. And Derek even gave me a nice uh, Gretsch guitar once in a, I think a 12 string. And I... The Gretsch guitar disappeared somewhere up in Edmonton. One of the guys in my band, I think, snipped it. Uh, I wish I still had it, but I used to stay at their house. So, you know, my my wife's back home with Chelsea, and, you know, uh, Chelsea had been born by then, and and I, uh, I don't know, it was terrible. Anyway, I did the uh, CFCN. Um, I did the home cooking show on CFCN where I... I had some of the guys from my recordings out there, and I had a guy named Roly Sanderson. I think he played with me there for a while. And uh, I did the home cooking show. I did two or three songs on there and uh, with a band. And then I um, I remember the, the, the uh, guy that interviewed me on that home cooking show was kind of a goofy guy. He says, yeah, I hear you're from the West Coast, eh? And I said, yeah. Said I heard they I heard they smoke a lot of salmon out there. In other words, he's joking about pot. And then I did the Miss Calgary pageant. Uh, that was something else. I had a tuxedo and and uh, there was a I don't know five six seven girls in it. The mayor was there, and uh, I got up and sang Holiday in Hollywood. And uh, I don't know if I sang one other song. I wish I had a film of that, but somebody sent me some pictures, so I have pictures of it. I do have the Home Cooking Show, which is on YouTube. Richard Stepp, Home Cooking Show. Uh, the Miss Calgary pageant would have been wonderful to have. It was televised, I know for sure. But that was on CFCN in Calgary. So I did radio interviews, a lot of stuff like that and promotion. I even did a thing for the Boutique of Leathers out there uh, where I was in the paper. They let me try on jackets and took a picture of me with some girl for, uh, you know, to put in the paper to advertise their company. And uh, I went and uh, 
he gave me a real nice long leather jacket for for doing that. Also, I I formed a band after a while out there called the Richard Step Band, and uh, I think that's the band Peter Sweetser played with us a little bit sometimes. He was the keyboard player. He lives in Vancouver now, but he was from Foster Child too, I think, and uh, he played a lot of different groups. But we did gigs at the Calgary Stampede. I did clubs in Calgary. I forget the name of the club. Um, different clubs in Calgary. And then I did uh, Edmonton. I did a... I can't remember if this is uh, with the Richard Step Band. I think it was, but I have a recording of some club up in Calgary played at. It was called the Boardwalk or something, I think. Uh, we did a week there with Long John Baldry, who had the song out, uh, Don't You Lay No the Boogie Woogie on the King of Rock and Roll. Man, he's great, that guy. If you ever get a chance, look him up on YouTube. His voice was something else. Uh, he came from England, and he was produced by Rod Stewart, and his first album, the one with uh, Boogie Woogie, was uh, Rod Stewart and Elton John produced that album. It was a huge hit back in the 60s, early 70s, and uh, he ended up living in Vancouver. I found out he was gay. I didn't know that at the time, but he's a big, tall, thin guy with a heavy-duty voice and a good guitar player and harmonica player. Anyway, uh, the Richard Step Band had... Uh, Nick Doctor, he was a session player. He was from South Africa, from Durban, and he'd lived in London for a while and worked at Pi Studios as a session uh, drummer. He worked with Van Morrison, Ronnie Wood, uh, Oliver, and he played with a band around around here called Oliver and the Elements. Then I had Michael Casper on bass. He was from a band called Hit and Run. And, of course, I mentioned Roly Sanderson played with us. He was uh, he did a lot of studio work and TV shows and stuff. Then I had uh, keyboard, uh, other than Pete Sweetser, I had a guy named Mike Hanford. Uh, he played a B3 Hammond. We had to pack that thing around. Um, and he played with uh, the Shondells out of Winnipeg originally. They had a, a record out called Another Man and Take It Back. And uh, he was in a band called the Gettysburg Address. That's what the Shondells ended up as, the Gettysburg Address. And they had a records out, Love is a Beautiful Thing, My Girl, and Come Back Baby. But um, he was kind of a sort of an ornery guy a little bit. <laughs> Heavy-duty guy, though. He could play, like, man, he was great. And sing good, he could play guitar. And I played guitar and piano in, in the band. I used to play quite a bit of guitar back in those days, and that's when I had my my nice white Les Paul. I remember we were playing uh, the Trade Winds, and no, it wasn't the Trade Winds. I used to play there in Calgary. I've got live recordings of that. We we're playing at a place up in Ed Edmonton, and uh, I leaned my guitar up against my amp, and it fell over and broke the neck. And then I got it fixed, and then I took it in Vancouver to Ichi and got it really fixed good, and gave it to Jesse. Uh, which he, I hope he looks after the thing. I, mean, I wish I, kind of wish I had it back myself. I like that guitar, but uh, anyway, Jesse loves it too. So, and he's proud of it. and I'm glad. Um, so anyway, we uh, we we went around as that band for a while, and uh, we did. I don't know. We did gigs all over the place, and I did that. Uh, Oh, the guy that owned a Boutique of Leathers where I did the modeling thing, his name was Barry Lamley. He also started a, a school out here, The I think it was called the Columbia School of Broadcasting, and um, he offered to record me there once, later years, as a sort of a student, you know, not a student. The students would practice on me. I thought, I'm not doing that, not after what I've been through. But living at McKinnon's was... Uh, uh, I don't know. He, she had three boys, uh, Mitch, Brady, and Tyler. Mitch was kind of a, old, the oldest one, and then uh, Tyler. And Brady was a little off kilter. I don't know what was wrong with him, but Mitch uh, Mitch was sort of like a, I think he was kind of like a dope smoker kind of a guy. But I remember when I used to stay there, they used to have Grey Cup, and... Uh, 
the Grey Cup uh, parties, they'd be, get up and start drinking champagne with orange juice for breakfast. I did a lot of drinking in those days, which, you know, they drank a lot, those people, and Lynn chain smoked. I ended up smoking. Uh, you know, I smoked on and off all my life, but Lynn smoked constantly, you know, and uh, she, uh, I think she's died now of lung disease. But they would have... All day long, you know, like on party days, it'd be champagne breakfast, uh, champagne for breakfast, and then, uh, you know, in the early afternoon, it'd be like uh, drinking scotch. We used to drink scotch and drambuie, rusty nails. And then it would be after dinner, you know, Spanish coffees or Monte Cristos, which were coffee with brandy and Grand Marnier, you know, it was like, holy crap, they drank a lot. And Derek was uh, Derek was a real nice guy. He uh, was a salesman out there, and he he was really good at that. <laughs> he made a lot of money, that guy, and he was always wheeling and dealing and buying stuff. That's where those guitars he got somehow. He ended up starting to have an affair with a girl named Susie. I was even with him one night when up in Edmonton when we were doing something. We went over to her place, and he ended up staying overnight with her. And then eventually him and Lynn broke up. And uh, anyway, I did a couple of road trips with Lynn where we did promotion, you know, for overnight things. But we always got, I made sure we had separate rooms. And, and But anyway, uh, I played a lot of clubs around there. And, and But one thing they did have nice with, it was a Cadillac Baritz, which I used to get to drive around a lot. And, uh, oh... I remember when we were in Edmonton playing, that's where I hurt my wrist. Nick Doctor and I were drinking one night up there. We are drinking brandy or something, a whole bunch of us, I guess, and I decided we were going to, or we decided we were going to arm twist, and uh, we started uh, arm twisting, and he, he went and jumped the gun on me, and I heard something snap in my right wrist, and I went, oh, shoot. We were playing a club there at the time, too. And I think I went to the hospital, and they said, oh, it's probably a broken tendon up your wrist. And so I had to wear a thing around my wrist for a while. And, you know, it, after that, my piano playing was never quite the same. I couldn't hit... I used to use my little finger to hit fast note, did it, did it, did it, you know. So then I had to start using my, my finger next to my little finger, I, I use my little finger nowadays, but that wrist still hurts. If I don't watch out, if I do something too much with it, it starts to hurt. So it, it kind of screwed me up for the rest of my life, that did. And uh, anyway, uh, I remember Chelsea came out with Lisa once to stay at McKenna's when I was out there. And uh, they had this one, they had a living room that they never used with all the fancy crap in it. And... Uh, Chelsea broke an ornament out there. But, you know, I don't think Lisa and Chelsea ever felt welcome out there because the McKinnons took over my whole life and it was like I was their little playboy and little plaything, I mean, and, you know, the the little recording star and, uh, you know. And so, I don't know, that kind of started the road to breaking up our marriage. And finally, I got... After, you know, my second album couldn't seem to go anywhere and I kept, you know, going out there, flogging away on these road trips and staying at that house for, you know, be a month at a time and being away from my family, I finally just said, that's enough. And I went home and I thought, well, I'm going to start recording at home because the album never went anywhere and I was sick of the whole thing by then. I, that You know, I started getting depressed then about that whole thing. I, you know, I had enough of that. Anyway, uh, it's too bad that second album, you know, there I'm kicking myself again for not going to Nashville. That would have changed my whole life, but maybe it would have changed it for the worst. Who knows, you know? So you just do what you do as you go through life, and everybody goes through things like that. So my next chapter coming up is going to be when I returned home from Calgary, and uh, we'd... Uh, I think, uh, I don't know where I was. We were. I was living at Dogwood Street by then, but by the time I was doing all the Calgary stuff. Um, and so I'm going to start on the next chapter. 
uh, the hired guns days and dogwood when we were, the kids were little.